Hello and welcome to our last reading through 2 Samuel chapter 8. As noted yesterday, and you recall that 2 Samuel 8 in and of itself is a summary of a collection of time that David himself solidified his kingdom. Yesterday we looked at the military campaigns of David, which demonstrated the reality that the borders of Israel were now in accordance with the promises of God through Abraham. Today's passage deals with the people who were at the heart of that kingdom. We can often think when we come to kings that the king rules with an iron fist and that everybody underneath that particular king is subservient to the king. That is not the case in Israel. Israel is not meant to be a dictatorship. It is meant to be a theocracy where under the rule of God, a king leads his people with justice and righteousness in the truth of God's word and he gets around him people who are actually of one mind in order to do that together. So the list of names will come up and then we'll come back and see the importance of both these people but also the concept that this is actually trying to reinforce. 2 Samuel 8 beginning at verse 15. David reigned over all Israel doing what was just and right for all these people. Joab's son of Zeruiah was over the army. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was recorder. Zadok, son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, son of Abiathar, were priests. Saraiah was secretary. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Kerithites and the Perithites. And David's sons were priests. Apart from the difficulty of uh, hearing those names and thinking of them in their contrast within the scriptures themselves, the idea hopefully is reasonably clear. David had a good array of people who were armed in the right areas of life in order to lead Israel in justice and righteousness, a promise that was made to uh, Abraham that he would fulfill. And it's a promise that reflects the character of God. God is just in that he is always righteous. The words justice and righteousness in our text are basically synonyms for the same idea. The nuance is that the righteousness of God is always just and that the king should be aiming to deliberate on that righteousness and justice in order to help his people be that as well. And that should be seen through the king and through his immediate leadership. It's a good thing for the church to know, isn't it? The church is not a one-man band or a one-woman band. The church is a band of people under the leadership of God who implement his justice and righteousness given to us through Jesus Christ amongst one another for the benefit of God's kingdom growing. And I think this is exactly what we're supposed to take from our passage today. It is not that David is the king and all others are subservient to him. As you saw right away in verse 15, David reigned over all Israel, doing what is just and right for all his people. The word all is mentioned twice to reinforce that David is not hopefully a king for himself, which was the promise that was given by Samuel way back when Saul became the king that would say, look, because you guys are wanting a king to be like the other nations to make you powerful, you will choose a person with those powerful desires who will not lead your people in the theocratic ways, but in the totalitarian ways. That man was Saul. David is here, and it's reiterating that this is not the case with him. He wants to be a man after God's own heart, and that means to lead his people with justice and truth. We can boil that down to our churches. We can even get it further down to our homes, where mothers and fathers should be leading their children in justice and truth, all their children, all the same, in order that they themselves will raise up their own families to do the very same as well. Our text continues on with verse 16 with that hint of problem which occurs in our text in two ways which we'll look at together. The first is Joab, son of Zeruiah. And remember, he is a relative of David who let his revenge get the better of him when he went to attack the remaining elements of the family of Saul. And we know that David made a pronouncement against him about his long-term history within the family of Israel. At this time, he is still a military commander in Israel, but his time, sadly, will come where he will face the justice of God. The next group of people, sometimes we don't know a lot about them, but we know enough. The next group, it says there, is Jehoshaphat, son of Ehilud, was the recorder. Now, we're not sure what that job basically entailed. It could be either a librarian or a person who used to bring the news of the uh, 
affairs of the world uh, to David's doorstep. But whatever the case might be, this man was it. The next person we do know a lot about, and he becomes important within this next couple of chapters within 2 Samuel and then Kings. Zadok, son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, son of Abiathar, were priests. The reason that these two men are mentioned, apart from their uh, presence in the scriptures, remember Abiathar, the last surviving remnant of the priests of Nob that David himself uh, rescued and led through all the years he was in the wilderness. Abiathar was his loyal friend. And Zadok becomes a priest uh, continually in the presence of David who leads Israel. And so these two men speak about the before and after of David's kingship. But more importantly, they also can trace their family lines back to Ithamar and Eleazar, the sons of Aaron. And so they give us a restored hope that David himself is not a king in the line of Saul, but a king in the line of Abraham, in the sense that he's going to obey the word of the Lord and the teachings given through Moses about how a Aaronic priest can actually serve God. So we have confidence here that David is instituting a leadership structure best suited to actually leading the people of Israel in the word of God. We continue on. Sariah was secretary. That's, I think it means more secretary of state in our types of context. Uh, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Kerithites and the, the Pelethites. So these uh, guys were the bodyguards of David, sort of like those inner sort of sanctum uh, leaders who kept David safe from either assassination or from uh, rebellion. And our man mentioned here, Benaiah, he'll become an important figure as well. So these guys are loyal. They are faithful except for Joab, sadly, but he was never faithful by the looks of things. And their task is to lead Israel and protect Israel against incursion, against idolatry, and against, hopefully, David not becoming a totalitarian ruler. The second little uh, troubling bit is right at the end. The first bit was Joab, that he still is in command of the army. The second bit is right at the end here. And David's sons were priests. All the information we have about David's sons when they perform priestly functions are always bad. We have that in chapters coming up with Absalom and Adonijah. It only ever goes poorly. And the king has the role of a priest outside of David and in part Solomon. Again, that always goes bad. And so it's a hint that why on earth were David's sons priests? They aren't members of Aaron's family. And so it's left hanging there so that we get the picture that whilst generally speaking all is going well, there's a few things that sort of speak to the fact that all is not perfect. Remember, David is not a perfect ruler. He is ruling a theocracy under the power of God, but he is a sinful man like you and I. It is not till the Lord Jesus comes that we have the perfect king, the perfect saviour, who will rule his world in justice and truth. The church is not perfect. You are not perfect. We will make mistakes. Hopefully when we make mistakes, we realize that we have sinned against God and against his glory and we repent and he helps us and enables us to live for his honor and glory in the future. Never think that you are perfect like Jesus. We are all beings like David. Sometimes we stuff up, but we all need help and we all need the provision that God gives us in order to lead his people in justice and righteousness. Amen.